Welcome to this podcast on the Gospel lesson for Pentecost 11, Series B, which is John chapter 6, verses 35 to 51. I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen here at Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne. And uh, we are building on last week's Gospel lesson. Uh, as I mentioned in the podcast for Pentecost 10 last week, uh, we have three um, Sundays in the Pentecost season where we leave Mark and go to John, and they all are from the Bread of Life discourse. So in a sense, they build on one another very uh, sequentially because they're from the same uh, discourse. Uh, one might say it is helpful to listen to all three podcasts uh, to, to kind of see how they hang together, these three different uh, gospel lessons. It's also important if one is preaching on the John 6 consecutively in these three weeks, is that one emphasizes uh, some of the unique elements of the of, on Pentecost 10 text and some of the unique elements, again, of this text for Pentecost 11 and some of the unique elements of, of the latter part of the Bread of Life discourse then in Pentecost 12. Uh, I did mention um, in uh, the previous, dis, uh, previous podcast how important the context is for this um, text, namely that we are in the season, we are at the time of the, of, um, of the Passover, so Jesus is speaking about himself as the bread of life in the context of the Jews are celebrating the Passover, and two important events happened shortly before the bread of life discourse. Jesus walked uh, first fed the 5,000 in the wilderness, just as Yahweh fed Israel in, in the wilderness after the Exodus. And then he also uh, walks on water to his disciples and, and stills the storm, brings them safely to the other side, just as Yahweh delivered Israel through the Red Sea, Jesus delivers his disciples through the stormy Sea of Galilee. And so you see the, the, the patterning of Jesus as Yahweh um, in the Old Testament as the pre-incarnate Son, and now Jesus as the incarnate Yahweh doing these similar miracles uh, in uh, the life of, of, um, of these first century Jews. Another thing that I think to, to keep in mind in terms of this particular text is that it does pick up on verse 35, which was the end of Pentecost 10 gospel lesson, it becomes the first verse of the, um, of the Pentecost 11 gospel. So you have that kind of holdover of a key teaching. So one might say uh, it helps the continuity uh, to have that restated at the beginning of this text. And it's also true uh, in, at the end of this text, verse 51, which is the end of Pentecost 11 gospel lesson, becomes the first verse of Pentecost 12. So similar way that will, your, your hearers will hear that um, repeated again, namely next Sunday in the Gospel lesson. Uh, let's uh, go to the actual text here. Uh, and again, this first verse is the one we looked at right at the end of uh, Pentecost 10. Uh, it's a very important thematic verse in terms of uh, it's the verse where Jesus introduces himself uh, as the bread of life. So he says to them, I am, we talked about this in the, the previous podcast, how ego I me, apart from a predicate, namely in its absolute form, is an important way that Yahweh identifies himself. Um, you have in the Hebrew text, ani hu, or uh, Ani Anihu or Nokihu, and it's often translated, it is I. It's an important self-disclosure formula. The Septuagint simply has ego I me or ego I me, ego I me. So that in itself is an important way in which Jesus is speaking about himself uh, as Yahweh. Here, though, it has a predicate. It's not in the absolute form. It's I am the bread of life. And there are seven of these predicate nominative sayings. This is an important first one. And uh, he identifies himself as the bread of life. Uh, I talked uh, last time in the previous podcast 
Uh, many Jews thought that the bread of life in the first century was Torah. Obedience to Torah is what supplied our, our uh, spiritual needs. So Jesus is pointing them away from that kind of understanding to the fact of that he, the person, um, namely the flesh and blood Jesus, is really the essential uh, uh, bread that, that meets all of our spiritual needs, uh, directing them away from somehow their role in salvation to uh, what we would say a monergistic understanding that Jesus is the, um, uh, that God alone saves us uh, and provides for all of our, uh, our, our spiritual needs uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, we're saved by grace alone is another way of expressing that and as we Lutherans do. So I am the bread of life, the one coming to me. We talked about this last time. These two participles explain one another. Who is the one who comes to him? It's the one who believes in him. And the Holy Spirit works that faith. The Father draws us by, by having the Spirit work through the means of grace to, to work faith. And then the beautiful gospel, um, I emphasized this in a previous podcast, but state it again. You have ume plus the subjunctive, this double negative plus the subjunctive, no stronger way of expressing this in Greek than this, namely, uh, the one coming to me will surely not hunger, and the one believing in me will surely not thirst. Um, you have the ume plus the subjunctive used in John frequently, and it's, it's a way in which Jesus is casting out any doubt. This is absolutely true. We should not have any doubt about this. Jesus will meet all spiritual hunger, all spiritual thirst, anything else is a substitute. Anything else is really false religion. Um, uh, you know, the world provides what they think is important to means to meet our, our needs, uh, and, and all of it is our false substitutes. Jesus is the one who meets those needs fully, and that's what's being expressed here. If we, when we believe in him, we will surely not hunger spiritually, or we will surely not thirst. And you have in this text, as in last week, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful image. We all need food on a daily basis. And, and so it's an image that, that we, can, we can play off of in our preaching. Um, we all have an even more desperate need to be spiritually fed. Just as we have to eat in order to sustain our physical life, so also we need to have our spiritual needs met. And Jesus is the one who meets those fully, not just 10%, not just 50%, but meets them fully. Uh, then going on, verse 36, you get into the new material uh, for this particular text. Uh, and they, um, uh, and, and he, he said, uh, but they said, uh, I say to you that you have seen me and you don't believe. So Jesus is now basically uh, confronting them, building on last week's gospel uh, lesson. Uh, and he's saying, you have already seen me, perfect tense, but yet you are not believing. Uh, he is convicting them of their unbelief. They've seen key signs that he's done, but they have not seen how those point to his true identity as God in the flesh, as the Messiah come to deliver them from sin. And then he, uh, he, uh, he says, Everyone um, who, um, whom the Father uh, gives to me, so here he's speaking of how the Father graciously works to, to bring people to faith, uh, that Jesus is speaking of this now, uh, shall, um, who gives to me, um, come to me. Here you have that language of, uh, I would say, of election, that, that Jesus um, uh, is speaking about the fact that the Father draws people to him, and then they come to him. They are brought to faith. And the one coming to me, again, that's that language that we saw earlier, Erkomai is un, um, understood here with the, the, uh, the, 
The participle erkomenos is explained with the participle pistoion. Uh, so all the ones coming to me shall surely not, again, same kind of construction we saw up here. Ume plus the subjunctive, there's no doubt about it, shall sure, I will surely not cast out. Namely, uh, it's not a matter of, of, of people coming to faith and then Jesus rejecting them. Whenever the Father draws people to faith through the work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus keeps them in the faith. He who began that good work in you will keep it to the end. So the emphasis here is very gospel-oriented. Jesus doesn't reject anyone who is brought to faith in him, but rather he receives them and, and keeps them. Uh, and because I have come down here, that language of the perfect tense, speaking about the fact of the Son as the one who has descended from heaven, I have come down from heaven, uh, not in order, hina, uh, expressing the purpose, the purpose clause, in order to do my will. So Jesus hasn't come to do his own selfish desires in any way, but rather there's a complete congruence between what he is doing and what the Father's will is. Uh, the Son doesn't have his own um, list of, of, uh, of things he wants to do. He follows the list that this Father has given him. Uh, so, but um, to do here, the language of, um, of poion functions with this second clause, but I am doing the will of the one who sent me, and clearly the one who sent Jesus. In the Gospel of John, it's very frequent, that language of pempo or apostello, Jesus is always sent by the Father. He is the, the one who is... Uh, uh, the sent one, and then he in turn sends out uh, his apostles to, uh, to continue the work that, uh, that he has given them to do. Uh, so this is the will of the one who sent me, namely, what is the will of the Father? It's expressed with this hina clause, uh, in order that everyone whom uh, uh, has been given to me, who, who is given to me, shall not perish uh, from me, but uh, I will give to him uh, the, uh, but I will raise him up, rather, on the last day. This language of anasteso, um, we are uh, familiar with it in the sense of resurrection. Uh, uh, anastasis is the, uh, the term for resurrection. Here you have the verb, anasteso, on uh, Anahiste me is the, uh, the, the root verb. But here you have, but I will raise him up, and then the language of the last day. Sometimes people say John doesn't have much um, future eschatology. That is actually a completely wrong understanding. John has a lot of realized eschatology in the teaching of Jesus, but he also has a lot of future eschatology, namely the last day, teaching about the last day. And we talked about how the fact that you have mentioned uh, in, in last week in Pentecost 10, we talked about the fact that it mentions life. Here's where you get into a beautiful discussion uh, in this particular text about what life is. Life is, is eternal and life is one that climaxes with resurrection. I will raise him up on the last day. So not only does he... Um, he, he uh, give him a life that it does not perish or is not destroyed, but he will also raise up that, uh, that uh, uh, body on the last day. That life will not only continue, but it will, it will climax in resurrected glory. So beautiful gospel, beautiful teaching of uh, our future eschatology, our future resurrection right here. Um, and again, unpacking further, what is this life that Jesus gives? He's the bread of life. So what I would emphasize from this text is that Jesus is the bread of life who gives eternal and resurrected life. Uh, it's a text that really is unpacking what is this life that, uh, that we receive by partaking of Jesus, who is this bread of life. It's a life that goes on eternally, 
and it's a life that climaxes with being uh, raised up on the last day. And then verse 40, uh, he continues, Jesus continues, uh, for this is the will of my Father. So he's used this language frequently. We've seen it a couple of times already uh, in the previous verses. Here it's stated again. What is the will of the, the Father? In order that everyone who beholds, the, everyone beholding the Son and believing, so this is the emphasis on, on uh, we are saved solely through faith. Uh, it calls to mind that beautiful text in John chapter 3. Jesus is the Son of Man who is lifted just as Moses lifted the serpent up. He's, this, he's the Son of Man lifted on the cross that whoever looks and believes is, is, is saved. So whoever beholds the Son and believes salvation through faith alone, whoever believes in him has eternal life. So what is this life that we're speaking of? It's an eternal life, and it's also one that climaxes in being raised on the last day. We see a beautiful explanation then of what is this life we get by partaking of Jesus, by having him meet all of our spiritual needs, by believing in him. It's uh, an eternal life and one that climaxes in resurrection. And I will raise him up, and again, Driving that same point, same verb, anastaso, uh, I will raise him up on the last day. You see again that emphasis on our future eschatology. Uh, pastorally, this is an important point. Sometimes people say, I believe in Jesus, and yet, you know, I'm suffering, my life is difficult. One of the things that we as pastors and as Christians can always do is help people see that the blessings that we receive are present, namely we have forgiveness and peace in the present here and now, but a lot of them are also future. And it's those future blessings that we sometimes need to put before people because the present isn't always offering a lot of hope. And uh, People are struggling with a terminal illness, they're struggling with a huge challenge that, doesn't, uh, that won't be easily changed in their life. Uh, well, we recognize that it's not only this life that we have blessings, but we have future blessings. And that's pointed to here. On the last day, um, we will be healed totally and physically through the resurrection. Even though on this side of, um, uh, of our life, namely our life here on earth, we will not, we may have temporary healings through through um, um, uh, the blessing of doctors and nurses, but we will certainly, uh, uh, we certainly also go through a lot of physical challenges. A true eternal healing happens on the last day. And sometimes we have to point people forward beyond today, tomorrow, to that ultimate, our ultimate future, namely resurrection on the last day. Let's scroll up here. Verse 41, uh, it is significant that you have the same verb, uh, let's scroll up, yeah, there we go. <laughs> the same verb, okay. The same verb here uh, and here is that's used in the Septuagint to speak about the complaining of the Israelites. And so just as you, and in the um, King James, it's translated murmuring. I think that kind of picks up well um, the, the, the translating that particular verb. So you have the Jews, therefore, and you have the imperfect form here, were habitually murmuring um, concerning him and said. Uh, so one might say, just as Israel... Uh, complained about the grace of God. Hey, you know, we just getting manna and quail. We're, you know, what else are we going to get? Uh, so you have um, the now um, the first century Jews reacting to Jesus in a similar way that they reacted to Yahweh in the Old Testament. And Jesus says, um, uh, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. So again, restating um, what he said earlier, uh, he is that same one who, has, who had descended, fed Israel in the past, 
now he has come ultimately to, um, to save the world, to bring life to the world. What do they say? Uh, they respond, uh, is not this one Jesus, the son of Joseph? So they obviously aren't recognizing him as Yahweh. Uh, they're recognizing more of his human nature, not his divine nature. Uh, and then, uh, uh, whom we know uh, the father and the mother. So is this not the, the, the Jesus that, that has a father and mother, Joseph and Mary? Uh, how now is he saying that he has descended from heaven? So not recognizing his divine nature, not recognizing his pre-existence as the eternal son from the father, um, rejecting that. Uh, and then what does Jesus answer? Verse 43, Jesus answers and says to them, do not grumble among one another. Uh, namely, he's, just as he had uh, warned Israel, he's now warning uh, these first century Jews. Uh, and then um, he said, no one is able to come to me uh, unless you have the, if not, the Father draws, um, draws him. The Father, the one who sent me, draws him. Now, this is actually a, a conditional sentence. You have the eon plus the um, subjunctive, but you actually have the apodosis, uh, the second half of the sentence first. Here you have your present tense verb, so it's a present conditional sentence, uh, and we would you know, normally say, if the Father, the one who sent me, does not draw him, uh, then uh, he is not able to come to me. That's the typical form, where you have protasis and apodosis. Here you have the protasis and apodosis of the conditional sentence flipped. Unless, or excuse me, no one is able to come to me unless the Father, the one who sent me, draws him. I think this is simply speaking about monergism. We can't be saved unless uh, the Holy Spirit works to bring us to faith. We can't of our own come to God. It's a beautiful statement of what we would say, we're saved by grace alone through faith. And then uh, you have, um, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, that beautiful gospel word about our future um, resurrection, that part of this life that God gives, the bread of life gives, that life is one that climaxes in resurrection. It's not just about um, the few decades we spend here on this earth. It's about an eternal life, and it's about a life that climaxes with resurrection. Then verse 45, um, this has been written in the uh, prophets. Uh, <clears throat> all of them will be taught ones of God. So Jesus is, is quoting the Old Testament here. And then, uh, then he goes on and says, uh, and everyone who hears from the Father and, um, and learns has uh, or, or comes to me. So basically, uh, Jesus is saying, if you are hearing the Father, and learning from the Father, you're going to come to Him. Why? Because there's a congruence. Everything the Father uh, says is also what the Son says. Uh, so when we are hearing the Fa uh, Jesus, we are, are hearing the same things as the Father. Jesus is emphasizing this throughout John, here also. Namely, what He says is what the Father says. What He does is what the Father does. So, if you reject him, you're rejecting the Father. If you receive him, you're receiving the Father. Um, beautiful Trinitarian theology uh, that's being emphasized here. And then, uh, he also points out, not that, um, that, um, uh, that anyone, uh, let me see, has seen the Father uh, except not that someone here, Tis, has seen the Father, uh, except the one being from God, this one has seen the Father. This is the same kind of statement that uh, John summarizes in chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is from the bosom of the Father, has made him known. 
So Jesus, that kind of theology in John 1.18 is based upon the teaching of Jesus that nobody sees the Father except the Son and the Son makes the, the Father known. He's the one who has descended all through history climactically in his incarnation in order to reveal the mystery of uh, the triune God. So uh, again, the eternal nature of the Son, the Son is always the one through whom we come to know the Father. He's the face of the Father. He's the one through whom we see the Father because we do not see the Father uh, in the sense of see the unveiled uh, glory of God, uh, the Holy Trinity. And then again, another one of these double amen, amen uh, sayings. It's a way of Jesus calling our attention uh, to what he is saying. So, amen, amen, I say to you, the one who believes... Um, has present tense eternal life. So we've emphasized the future aspect of, of life, salvation. Here is certainly an emphasis on the present. When, the moment we believe, we have eternal life as a present possession. There's more to come, but we already have all of our spiritual needs met. We have forgiveness, total forgiveness of sins, all sins already as a present possession. We have uh, a life that goes on uh, forever already now. That's a beautiful gospel uh, verb right there. And then he has another one of these restatements of the predicate nominative um, title. I am the bread of life. He said that uh, earlier in verse 35. It's restated here. Uh, and obviously he has unpacked what does it mean, uh, this life that he's speaking of. Uh, and then verse th 49, your fathers ate in the wilderness the manna and died. So the contrast between them just receiving manna and not receiving the bread of life, not receiving God coming to them graciously in the sun in the Old Testament. They, they, uh, many of them you know, uh, spurned God's grace and they died in the wilderness, even though they, they had... Um, they had manna. We talk, we talk about many of the, um, the challenges of uh, unbelief in, uh, in, um, in the wilderness. Uh, and that's documented well. Uh, and then Jesus goes on and says, This is the bread, uh, the one coming down from heaven um, in, um, in order that you eat of it and not, uh, and not die. So here the emphasis is how you will live eternally and you will, in a sense, not ever spiritually die. And then the most important verse in this particular gospel lesson is right here at the end. An absolute beautiful statement of universal atonement, of the inclusivity of God's action in Jesus Christ. Here he further defines what specifically is this bread uh, that he is offering. And he specifically, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread. Here is an additional modifier. Uh, again, I think tying in with the fact of this emphasis of, of uh, what he would do in bringing eternal life that is, uh, 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 so I am the living bread, not only the bread of life, but the living bread. The one coming down from heaven uh, the conditional sentence, if somebody eats of this bread, he will live unto eternal life. And here is where he spe specifies, what is this bread? Um, the bread which I gi will give, future tense, focusing on what he would do at the cross. He's speaking, you know, John 6, he's speaking what he will do in another year. Uh, the next Passover that's recorded in John, namely when he gives his life on the cross. So the bread which I will give is my flesh. And here is further modified. Which flesh? The, the in behalf of. Here's beautiful, uh, what I would call substitutionary atonement type of uh, language. This preposition is benefactor language in behalf of. Um, uh, the flesh in behalf of the life of the world, not just a few, but in behalf of for the whole world. He gives his life 
so that some may be saved, but he saves the whole world so that some may come to faith and receive the benefits of that. Uh, so it's a very much of a universal uh, uh, emphasis of understanding of Jesus' life. Uh, is my flesh that I will give on behalf of the life of the world. This is pointing forward to what Jesus would do in atoning for the sins of the whole world when his flesh is lifted up uh, in, in, in death and his blood is poured out as a sacrifice and payment for sin. Uh, here again, I think we have in this particular text uh, a great unpacking of what uh, Jesus is as the bread of life. Namely, we have an unpacking of what is this life. It's a life that's eternal. It's a life that climaxes with resurrection, anastaso, on the last day. And it's also specifically his flesh. We can't reject the humanity of Jesus. If we do, we're rejecting the source of salvation because it is specifically the flesh and blood Jesus uh, in his flesh and blood that atone for sin. That's how Jesus won salvation for us. And so when we believe in him, when we receive him, we receive him as not only true God, but as fully man, because that's the source of our salvation. Strong emphasis on on the incarnation, on the true humanity of Jesus in the Bread of Life discourse, one might say especially here and in the Pentecost 12 gospel lesson that follows next week. May the Lord now bless uh, your proclamation and teaching of this text uh, in the, the Sunday ahead.